Um, welcome back, everyone. We've uh, just started the recording of this second lecture today. We are going to start with Romans chapter 3 now. So let's just read Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Romans 3, 1 to 8. Um, let's see, Aaron, can you read that for us? Romans 3, 1 to 8, please. Sure, Pastor. Have the Jewish then any advantage over the Gentiles? Or is there any value in being circumcised? Much indeed in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jewish. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true, even though every, every man is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must be win your case when you are being tried. But what if our doing wrong serve to show up more clearly God's doing right? Can we say that God does wrong when he punishes us? This would be the natural question to ask. By no means, if God is not just, how can we judge the world? But what if my untrue serve God's glory by making his truth true stand out more clearly. Why should I still be condemned? As a sinner, why not say then, let us do evil so that good may come? Some people did have insulted me by accusing me of saying this very thing, this will be condemned as they should be. Mm. All right. So in this first part of chapter 3, Paul is asking some questions and answering those questions himself <clears throat> in relation to the judge, God's judgment, right? So he has established that, hey, everyone's going to be judged. And Jews, you really don't stand a chance in God's judgment uh, because you're not keeping the law. And of course, Gentiles, uh, they will be judged according to their the conscience. It's written there, so they have no excuse that we didn't know what's right and wrong, everybody. But we're all going to be judged according to the gospel. Now, about God himself as judge and how God judges, he's answering some. He asks some questions and answers that. So we call them rhetorical questions because um, his intent in asking the questions is to get people to think. His intent in asking the questions is to address some things that they are asking, uh, not to get an answer from them, because he himself is going to answer those questions. So this is this questioning is more of, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm addressing some things that you are thinking about. I'll ask the question, I will give you the answer, right? So these are rhetorical questions in these eight verses. So, so you, you know, so you can just follow his thinking here, uh, or how he's unfolding this truth. Now remember, the truth is coming from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is saying, okay, I need to give this to God's to the church. But it is being written for us in the skill, in the language, and with the context of the writer. That means, in this case, it's the Apostle Paul. It's going, he's going to be using his language. He's going to be putting in uh, his words, his thoughts. But the truth is coming, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit says, you know, you need to address this with, for the church, right? But the, but Paul is a very logical thinker, and he's, he's bringing, he's, he's, he's expressing the truth uh, in this manner for us. So he starts by asking a question, which obviously a Jew would ask. So uh, does that mean we Jews are of no use? and circumcision of no use, you know. Until now, we were saying that we are the chosen people of God, and uh, through us, all the nations are going to be blessed and all that. But now you're saying, Paul, uh, we're all sinners. I mean, we've all, so does it, is it, you know, useless or unprofitable uh, of being a Jew and a circumcised? So he's asking that question. And then he himself answers the question, verse two, of course not. You know, the Jew has the advantage. What is it uh, 
to, to them were committed to the oracles of God. So you are truly God's people because God committed to you his word. So he is not saying, you know, I'm totally discrediting uh, the importance of uh, being a Jew or any of these things. I'm not totally discrediting it, discrediting it. You know, hey, God chose these people and through them, he has revealed, given the revelation, the oracles of God. He answers that question. Then next question, which most likely, you know, his audience and the people there would have asked was, hey, so, uh, hey, that's verse three. So if we don't believe, uh, this, how does that affect uh, all of this? We, if we don't believe, you know, if we don't believe, will it change anything about God? So the law is given, the word is given, but we don't believe. And he says, well, even if you don't believe, it doesn't change who God is. God is still faithful. And verse 4, he says, let God be true, every man a liar. Right? So, you, somebody not receiving the word, somebody not believing, does not in any way change who God is. It will not affect who God is. God is still faithful. God is still true. Right? So that's the second question. The answer is quite obvious, but um, for, the, for the sake of his audience, he's asking these questions and answering them. So basically he's saying, look, if you don't believe, it doesn't change God one bit. He's still faithful. He's still true. Who God is doesn't change. Then verses 5 through 8, it's actually a series of questions, all about the same thing. The question is, hey, if my unrighteousness, that is my doing wrong, is, is showing how righteous God is, the one who's judging, so I'm doing wrong, it's showing that God is a righteous judge, then uh, is God uh, unjust? This is verse 5. Isn't, is God being unjust by punishing me? Because I am doing wrong. It is putting God in a good light, showing that he is the God who judges sin. Then uh, why is he punishing me? Or the same thing can be presented like this. If I'm telling a lie and it's showing that God is true, it's making God look good, that he's a God of truth. This is verse seven. Then why am I being judged a sinner? Because my lie is making God look good. Or, you know, uh, in the notes I've just shared, uh, you know, we could think of Judas Iscariot making an argument like this. You know, geez, Judas can argue. God, if I had not betrayed Jesus, Jesus would not have been crucified. People would not have been saved. So why are you judging me for betraying Christ? Because my betrayal, my I did something wrong, I betrayed. But what I did fulfilled, you know, it, 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 all these things happened. Christ was crucified, people were saved. So why am I being judged? Right? So this is an argument. What are the Jews arguing here? Uh, they're saying, 
our unrighteousness is revealing the righteousness of God. Our lying is revealing the truthfulness of God. That means the wrong we are doing is showing how good God is, or how great God is. So, you know, so why are we being judged for the wrong we are doing? Okay. So, uh, and then Paul is saying, uh, verse 8, that actually some people are falsely accusing Paul that he's teaching people, let us do evil that good may come. So, you know, so you can imagine Paul as an apostle, even in those days, uh, had to deal with false reports about him or about his ministry, about what he was teaching. And so here's one case in verse 8, where uh, uh, Paul is uh, opening up and saying, hey, some people are falsely accusing me that I am teaching. Let us do evil so good may come. Let's let's do sin. Let's sin, so that uh, you know God can be glorified or things like that. So that's a false report. But you see, or you know, how Paul, uh, even in his ministry, had to deal with these kinds of things. That was obviously not what he was teaching, but he is slanderously being reported. That means it's a false report that he's uh, supposedly teaching that. But Paul's response to that is verse 6. Does God want us to do evil so that he can look good? Did God want, does God want us to speak lies so he can look as the God of truth? Does God want us to commit unrighteousness so that God's righteousness can be shown? His answer there in verse 6, certainly not. Certainly not. God is not an unjust God. And God is going to judge the world. So he's judging our deeds. So God's response to Judas would be, Judas, I'll judge you for three things. I'll judge you for your deeds. I'll judge you for your desires. I'll judge you for your drives, your motivations. Your deed was betrayal. Your desire was 30 pieces of silver. Your um, your drive, what motivated you was, you know, just to uh, get favor with, to please the to please the Jews, the religious leaders, to make them happy. So I'll judge you based on your deeds, your desire, and your drive, your motivation. So God will still judge the world. So even though God bring something good out of our wrong. As a classic case, case classic example is um, <clears throat> that of Judas. Yeah, he did something wrong, but something, you know, God's purpose was carried out. So even though God does something good out of the wrong we've done, we are going to be judged. Uh, we are not going to be cond condoned because of that, but we are still going to be judged on these three things that he has already spoken of, our deeds, desires, and our drives. So God will still judge the world or judge us for these things. He's not going to overlook the wrong we've done just because he was able to bring something good out of it. Okay, so he has asked a set of questions in verse, verses 1 to 8. I'll just quickly review. First is, uh, what is the usefulness of being a Jew? and being circumcised. He says, hey, God gave to, gave to you the law, so to you the revelation, so you are important. Second, if we believe, I mean, if we don't believe, well, if you don't believe, it doesn't change who God is. God is still God of truth and uh, faithful. Third, should we, you know, doesn't our 
unrighteousness make God look righteous? So shouldn't we just continue doing unrighteous? No. He's going to judge our righteousness, our unrighteousness for what it is. He's going to judge that. Everyone follow me till verse 8. Any questions? Okay. So he's kind of, you know, addressed some questions that are going on in the minds of his, his audience, people, the Jews. And then he says, okay, having done that, here's what I want to drive home. That is verse 9 through verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 9 to 20. Let us read that passage for us. Okay, Kiran, can you read that for us? Romans 3, 9 to 20, please. Yes, sir. What then are we better than they? Not all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under the sin, as it is written, there is none righteousness, not one. There is one who uh, understands, there, uh, there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Those mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift and seed blood. Destruction and mercy misery. are misery are in their ways and and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be just, justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Mm. So, verses 9 through 20, this is the, the main, you know, the, the next point that he really is, is getting his people, the audience to say, okay, so are the Jews better than the Gentiles? No. What is the conclusion then? Both Jews and Greeks, the Gentiles, are all under sin. So, Jews, you are special to God. God has given you the oracles. And uh, if you don't believe, it doesn't change who God is. And uh, even the God uses our, you know, I mean, God, in spite of our un unrighteousness, he carries out his purposes. Um, so, so the conclusion is this, all are under sin. And then he quotes from the Old Testament, there is none righteous, not even one. There's no one who's seeking after God, Psalm 14, right? It says, uh, nobody who's seeking after God, there's nobody who's righteous. And then he, when he's just quoting from the Psalms, he said, you know, the people are speaking evil, they are practicing evil, uh, they are going after destruction, and, and they don't know, there's no fear of God. So basically he's saying, look, whether you're a Jew, whether they're talking about Jews or Gentiles, in a sense, all of us are like this. There's nobody who's righteous. We're all actually uh, sinful in our, in, in what we think, say, and do we are sinful. No one is righteous. And verse 19 and 20. So if you have the law, you'll be judged by the law. And ultimately, 
all the world who stands guilty before God. So that's the point Paul is telling, trying to get his audience, whether you're a Jew or a Greek, doesn't matter. All of us are standing guilty before God. And even the Jews, by the deeds of the law, you can never be justified because the law is actually exposing our sin. Because we have, you know, we've done all these things. We have, there's nobody's righteous. We have spoken evil. We have, you know, all these things. We have cursing. We have shed blood. There's destruction. There's misery. All this. So even those who have the law, you cannot be justified. But the law is only showing us that we are sinners. So, through all that he's written so far, through chapter 2, and he's answered some questions, early part of chapter 3, he's brought the, his people. Now he's writing to Jews and Gentiles now. He's addressing both equally. Okay? Whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Gentile, all the world stands guilty before God. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. And through the law, we cannot be justified. The law is only showing us we are sinners. So that's where he's brought his people to. And he's helping. Now, remember, he's writing to the church. So the church also needs to understand. This is very basic. Today, you know, we very easily say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We easily say that. But sometimes, you know, uh, we need to help people understand. Uh, yeah, this is true. This is how we are before God without Christ. Then he starts presenting the solution. Okay. We are all sinners. We are all guilty before God. We have all broken the law. But this is God's solution. And in giving this solution, Paul is maintaining something. He's maintaining that God is being righteous. Right? Because remember, some of them are thinking, hey, if my evil is bringing something good, then I should just continue doing evil. He said, no. God has actually provided a solution. And in doing this, God is maintaining his righteous. God is righteous. God is just. But he's providing a, a, a solution for us uh, in our predicament where we are all uh, sinners. Okay, Let's just read that from verse 21 through um, till uh, 26. And we will look at that. He's presenting the solution. Right? Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26. Uh, Roshan, maybe you can read it. Oh, okay, Prince, you want to read? Go ahead. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophet. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and no all who believed. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a proposition by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbe forbearance God had passed over the sin that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier. Justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Okay, thank you. So, says, okay. Let's give the solution. It says, now, God's righteousness. God 
Now remember the word righteous. To be righteous means to be blameless, to be just, to, to, to have nothing, no, nothing against you. To be righteous means to be blameless. So the blamelessness of God, the faultlessness of God, that is righteousness of God. God is blameless, God is faultless. Nobody can find any fault with him. And he's saying, the righteousness of God. Now, from our perspective, for us to be faultless before God, for us to be able to stand blameless before God, so that is from our perspective, and we say righteous. Now, when you say God is righteous, that means we're saying God is blameless, God is faultless. When we say we have been made righteous before God, we are saying we have been given this position of being blameless and faultless in God's eyes. So we are being made righteous. So he says, verse 21, this righteousness of God, which is... Uh, outside of the law, I mean, it doesn't come through the law. This ability to be blameless in God's eyes, this ability to be faultless in God's eyes, which is outside of the law. But the prophets had spoken about it, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And it's, they foretold God would do this. Okay. Even the righteousness of God it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To all and all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by the great, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, okay, look, the whole world is guilty before God. He's, he's, he's brought us to that conclusion in verse 19. And no one can be justified by law. That means nobody can be justified in his sight. That is the righteousness of God. No one can be righteous in God's eyes. You know, verse 20, justified in his sight or be made righteous in his sight by the law. Nobody can do that. But there is a righteousness that God is giving to everybody without any difference, differentiation. He's giving to the Jews and to the Gentiles. He's giving it to everybody. And this righteousness, he says, it is the righteousness of God. That means it is God's own righteousness. It's the righteousness that comes from God. And it is a righteousness that is given to all who believe. Through all who have faith in Jesus Christ. So, this righteousness is a righteousness that is from God. It is given to us. So what Paul is saying is this, you know, we are all, the whole world is standing guilty before God and we cannot be justified in his sight through the law, but there is God's own righteousness, which is being made available through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is verse 22, and it is to all who believe, regardless whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, God's own righteousness is being given because, hey, everybody's fallen short of, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone is sinned. So this is God's righteousness that God is making available to all who have faith in Jesus, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, and then verse 24 says, this just being justified or this being made righteous is freely by his grace. So he said, through faith. Now he's saying it's freely by his grace. And he says it is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Through the redemption. That word redemption is, uh, you know, in the Jewish mind, um, it has the idea of buying something back and restoring it to 
a place, buying something back with a price, you know. Uh, it has the idea of buying a slave out of a slave market, or it has the idea of paying a ransom to get somebody's freedom. So redemption, it is buying something back with a price and restoring it to its original state of freedom, etc. So he says, through this whole act of redemption in Jesus Christ, God is giving his righteousness freely by grace to everyone who believes. So this is how we can be made righteous. So he has, he has built up this understanding very clearly. We cannot be made righteous through the law. None of us are keeping uh, the law, whether it's the written law or the law in our conscience. None of us are able to do that. There is no one who's righteous. We've all sinned. And uh, we are all standing guilty before God. But God has done something. He's giving us righteousness. He's giving us this ability to be justified in His sight, to be blameless and faultless in His sight. He's giving it to us. And this is how He's giving it to us. To all who believe, to all who have faith in Jesus Christ, He's giving it to us freely by His grace, and He's giving it to us on the basis of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, on the basis of what Christ did by giving the price, the ransom price, and buying us out, uh, and uh, you know, by purchasing us and buying us out and restoring us to where God wants us to be. That's what he's saying. And then he continues, verse 25, about Jesus, he says, God has made him our propitiation. That that word there uh, in the Greek actually should be translated mercy seat. Now in English they've just translated it as propitiation, which is a, 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 an attempt to capture what would happen at the mercy seat. But the Greek literally means mercy seat. So he says in verse 25, God has set Christ as our mercy seat now mercy seat is you know going back into the tabernacle of moses and um, they had the outer court the inner court and the the most holy place or the holiest of holies and in the holiest of holies there was the ark of the covenant which was basically a wooden box covered with gold inside which was kept the um, the ten commandments and uh, aaron's rod and so it was kept inside with a symbol of God's presence, the box, the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant was a golden mercy seat. It was a seat, like a chair, made of gold, a gold mercy seat. And it was a, a symbol of, that's where God said, I, I will meet with you. My presence, my glory will be there. And I will meet with you. I will speak to you. And that is where the high priest went and he sprinkled the blood of the atonement. He sprinkled the blood. So when he sprinkled the blood, atonement was made. And God said, that's where I will you know, I'll meet with you. Uh, basically, it's, in, it's a sign of man being reconciled to God and God, man being able to meet with God because of the blood uh, of the atonement. So the word propitiation is an attempt to capture, you know, that whole picture of atonement at the mercy seat, man being reconciled to God, man being able to speak to God. You know. So what, what Paul is saying is Jesus has become our mercy seat. Jesus has become the place where atonement was made, where man has been reconciled to God, man is able to meet with God, now, man is able to be blameless, faultless, justified, righteous with God. So he says, verse 25, God set him forth as our mercy seat. Verse 25, by his blood, as Christ gave his blood, through faith, 
That's what God asks of us, have faith. And he says, this whole thing demonstrates God's righteousness. That means God himself is being righteous in doing this. Because, you know, in the past, God overlooked sin. That means he didn't pour out all the judgment on sin right then. He reserved it to be poured out here at the cross. And in doing so, God has been righteous. Verse 26, that he is righteous because sin has been judged. And therefore, he is not only righteous and just, so because sin has been just, judged, but he's also the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That means God is saying, I have judged sin, so I am a just God. I'm a righteous God. I've judged sin. But I'm also able to justify those who have sinned because their sins have been judged in the redemption that's in Christ. So Paul is basically saying, you know, God can both be the judge, the one who condemns sin, and the one who forgives the sinner because of the cross, because of Christ being made our mercy seat, because of the redemption that's in Jesus. God is just, God is righteous. He's also the one who makes us righteous, the one who makes us justified. He's doing both. He's judging sin, but he is acquitting the sinner. He's able to do it because of the cross. Go with me there till verse 26. Any questions? Okay. Right. Okay, thank you. Everyone's following. So, Paul has come to this, helped his audience see this. Now, we are all sinners. God is a righteous God. He's judged sin. That means he's being a just God. But he's justifying the sinner. He's being a merciful God. He's, he's, uh, he's being a, you know, he's, 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 he's giving us his goodness. Right? So, what is the conclusion? What do, what, does, what do I really want you to know? This is in the last few verses, verses 27 to 31. Verses 27 to 31. Uh, who has to read? Uh, sorry. Was, uh, Kanan. Kanan didn't read? Or Siddharth. 27 to 31, please. Anyone? Kanan, Siddharth. Neelam. Can I read, sir? Go ahead. Where then is boasting? It is excluded on what principle? On that of observing the law. No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the, not the God, sorry, observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith, do we then uh, nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. So, verse 27 through verse 31, thank you. Right, so it says, okay. So what's the conclusion? It says, you know, where can we boast? Uh, uh, where is boasting? It is excluded. In other words, nobody can boast. No one can, you know, uh, take any credit for themselves. Uh, 
how is boasting excluded? Because of the law of faith. Where is boasting? It's nobody can boast. It is excluded. Why is it excluded? Because of the law of faith. It is verse 28. This is the conclusion. Man is justified by faith. Or man is made righteous by faith. He's put in a right standing with God. He's made false and blameless before God by faith outside of the deeds of the law that means it's not dependent on the deeds of the law by doing things of the law so he says look this is a conclusion I want to bring all of us to understand Jews and Gentiles so he's writing to these believers he's saying you know you see how he's developed the whole thing Jews you can't talk too much I know you have the law but You've all broken it. Gentiles, there's a conscience God can hold you accountable for. But the fact is, all of us have sinned. And God has given, is giving us the solution through Jesus Christ. So none of us can boast. And we are all justified by faith. So verse 29. Is he, yeah, verse 29, is he the God of the Jews, Gentiles? Yeah, he's God over everybody, right? He's God of the Jews, he's God of the Gentiles, and both Jews and Gentiles are going to be justified the same way, which is through faith, that's verse 30. Whether you're circumcised, that's whether you're Jewish, the uncircumcised a Gentile, it is going to be through faith that we are going to be justified. So that's the main thing he's getting to. Then he says, well, then uh, what's the use of the law? Well, he's saying, we are not uh, getting rid you know, we're not making void the law, though saying the law has been useless. No, it has served the purpose uh, uh, do, do we make the law void through faith? No. We establish the law. How do we establish the law? Because we have stated nobody can keep the law all of us are sinners, and the law serves that purpose. The law has exposed that we are all sinned. That all Jew and Gentile are standing guilty before God. And God has been just in condemning the sin. The same sin which the law condemns, God has condemned. Is he has judged it in the person of Christ. And through that, he can justify people who have faith in Christ. So faith, in effect, has established the law. Because faith has brought everybody to this, because everybody has come to this place where you have to have faith in Christ. Because on through the law, we've been, our weakness has been exposed. Our sin has been exposed. So faith, in effect, establishes what the law has always been telling us. That we have fallen short of God's glory. So that's what he concludes now at the end of verse uh, chapter 3. Right? That we are justified by faith, whether you're Jew or Gentile, we're all justified by faith. God is God of the Jews and also of the Gentiles. And this step of faith is just, you know, is um, establishing or affirming what the law has been saying. We are saying that we cannot keep the law. When we come by faith, we are saying we cannot keep the law 
Therefore, we have faith in the person of Christ. So we are establishing the law. We are affirming the law, saying, yeah, we can't keep it. We are sinners. Everyone with me so far? Okay, so that brings us to the end of chapter 3. Next week, we'll get into chapter 4, where he tells us more about the importance of faith. Right? So till now, he says, look, so right now, the conclusion is faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can have, we can be justified. We can become blameless before God. And then chapter 4, he emphasizes faith. Right? So we will pick that up next week. Can we close in prayer, please? I would uh, uh, thank you for uh, listening. And uh, somebody could close in prayer and we will dismiss after that. Thank you, Father God. Father God, we just come before you, Sean, Father God, once again. Father God, thanking you, Father God, for your... Uh, your word and in the the subject father god father god thanking uh, you father god to bless us father god thank you for your wis wisdom and knowledge father god that we we uh, understood father god the nicely the subject father god the roman book and father god father god thanking you father god we understood that we justify uh, justified by uh, faith father god thanking you father god uh, help us to uh, stay father god to uh, Help us to walk by faith, Father God, to every step and every moment, Father God. Father God, just give you more revelation and your blessing and uh, your wisdom, knowledge, Father God. Thanking you. Upcoming time, I'm just submitting to your hand, Father God. And everyone, the sir and all the students, Father God, I'm just submitting to your hand. You just take care of everything, Father God. Thanking you. Almighty Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being in the class today. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you shortly. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Everyone.